Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. And if you're listening to us on audio only, I'd appreciate you rating and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen to it. And of course, if you like what I do here, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube and hit that bell for notifications. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for Kung Fu Genius fans. Right now, you can get an all access one month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right hand corner fill in your email and password and use the code kfg trial to get your free trial to the issues from 2011 to the current issue that's right all the issues even the one with this guy on the cover my kung fu genius column is in all the new issues as if you need another reason to get this awesome magazine go get your free trial subscription today for all that information check out the description below and with that let's get started all right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sort of nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Wing Chun, lots of you're not the Kung Fu Genius, my daddy's the Kung Fu Genius. Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu Genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Word is, I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Practice all day like a genius. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Sifu. So, I don't know, man. I thought after the last episode where I came with you know, a jacket, and mm-hmm. I just had a, you know, Chinese undershirt underneath, no tie or anything like that. I I stepped it up because you had been stepping up, and you're like, no, I only wore the jacket for that one thing because of work. Mm, now, I come right. dressed in my minor threat shirt, and here you are in a jacket and tie. What's up with that? Jacket and tie because I got work after. What do you mean? It's Monday. What Don't you work on Friday? How does this work? No. What don't do you mean? Look, don't look like you're today's, going to work in that. Job. You don't today's look like you're Friday? going to work. Yeah. Today's not Friday. I'm starting to think that you're always trying to, like, you know, be dressed a little bit better than me, and then you're always trying to make me look like a straight ass I when we I come were dressed both up. Dressing up today. Oh, you thought we were both dressing up? Yeah, because you so, dressed up last time. I dressed up last time because the time before you dressed up, and I look like a straight but ass. I was going to work. Uh huh. Okay. So, no, I get it. I get it. All right. I get it. You want to be the one in the suit and, you know, make your seafood look like a straight, you know, homeless man. All right. No, I get it. It's cool. You know what? You know what, Dre? You know what, Dre? It's cool. I get it. It's fine. All right. See what happens next time. I don't know what you're insinuating. We'll see what happens next time. I don't know what you're insinuating. So anyway, here we are with another Ask Me Anything episode. So oh, let's get AMA. to it. AMA. AMA. Not an AMA. MMA. All right. Not a MMA. All right. Butcher Wing 100. What's your wing? How we doing? How we doing? Good, All right, good, what good. do you think of Bruce Lee's level of chi sao compared to his HK Seahings while being in the U.S.? I read, when he returned first time with his student, Doug Palmer, Doug bested it man's students with more direct and powerful chi sao. What was he doing that was so different and effective as his HK brothers? Mm. Jesse Glover's Chi Sal looked very imposing compared to others. Okay. I think Doug Palmer's secret is that he was a big white guy doing it with a bunch of small Chinese dudes. <laughs> All right? So, uh, no, not to take anything away from Doug Palmer. I mean, look, the, pr- the problem is when people hear this stuff, they go like, oh, Bruce Lee taught this one guy and then brought him to Hong Kong on that trip, which was in the early 60s, where Bruce went to Hong Kong basically for... Uh, a number of months, mm-hmm. and um, Doug Palmer came and, and stayed with him, I think, for about a month. In fact, it's, he talks all about that in, in his book, which came out last year, uh, which is a fascinating read. Um, and What's I the think, name of his book again? Um, I, I, don't re- I don't remember the name of the book. I read it last year. Yeah. Uh, Doug Palmer, it's like a Bruce Lee. Oh, God. Uh, hmm. Of course, the moment I don't remember it, everyone is going to comment, the book is this. It's like, guess what? All right. When you have Google in hindsight afterwards when you're watching this, yeah. hey, the m- amount of stuff where people go like, oh, well, actually, this is da, 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 da. I'm going to go, actually, you look that up on Google after you saw the episode. All right. Because right, I'm right. doing this without any preparation. Uh, I uh, No, man, it's crazy. I read the book last year and it's a fascinating book. Good but book. for the life of me, I don't remember the Doug uh, Palmer. I know. Yeah, you, I don't. I don't remember the title. Um, right. I will remember it as soon as I do this episode. So <laughs> I'm sure the 80 people who will comment the title in the episode. Very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, people. So um, 
I think people put a lot of stock in like, oh, maybe Bruce trained, like in this kind of story, Bruce trained someone, he brought that student and that student bested a bunch of Yip Man students. Well, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and to use that as some kind of like knock in general in terms of like the more classical Wing Chun or whatever. And like, OK, so I'm going to tell you something. All right. Usually when a Sifu brings their students overseas, maybe back to Hong Kong or to, to meet, you know, the, their teacher or something like that, they don't bring their B level students. They don't bring their C-level students, all right? The student who's in the back of the school, yeah. who's, you know, barely trying. And that's not the that's one not that the comes guy. to Hong Kong with the Sifu, all right? Yeah, so the, the problem is, the problem players. is people go like, well, look, I mean, this is a clear sign that, uh, you know, Bruce's teaching methods or his training methods were just so much superior to what they were doing in Hong Kong. And you go like were they there on a Monday night where it was like the Yip Man C team? <laughs> These, a bunch of new students that weren't really dedicated. Beginner maybe class. They, yeah, or maybe just hobbyists who come mm -hmm. twice a week. Because think about it. Like, I go to Hong Kong usually every year that's not in a freaking global pandemic. And I bring my students with me to Hong Kong and we go there and we bring like a good group. And generally this group are your more dedicated, your more hardcore students. So there you are bringing kind of like your highlight reel as an instructor okay. and then showing up to a normal Monday class where you got people who are like accountants and, you know, doing this and doing Wing Chun for fun. Oh, right, right. And then you're going to go, yeah, see, my best guys are totally better than the dudes who just showed up on Monday. Right. So I think people don't realize this, like just because you learn from someone famous or just because you're doing a famous style or whatever does not mean that you are the ex like the perfect example and representation of that teacher's methods. All right. Because in, in the same vein, I believe that Bruce had met with Wong Sun Leung in one of those early trips to Hong Kong, where there was that same one okay. with Doug Palmer or the one where he come, came later with Brandon. And wasn't able to like best his seeing in Chi Sao. Okay, now in in all out fighting or whatever, maybe that would be a different story. But we're just talking about Wing Chun right now, right? So the first thing is Doug Palmer was a tall dude. Okay, big okay. guy, and a lot of the 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 Chinese students at that like time, myself tall. Yeah, super tall. Everyone thinks you're tall because the way you frame yourself in the camera, uh, <laughs> the way you come dressed like a some someone, you know, tall. like you're the you're the guy who this podcast is about here, yeah, right? That the big and tall about that's right. yeah, big and tall. Yeah, yeah, you just had you just had someone you know trim it up for you a little bit, right? right? right. Yeah, just tuck it in around the corners. It'll be fine. So, uh, you know, you have these kind of comparisons and it's like, well, Doug Palmer is a kind of tall dude. And maybe some of the students there, especially if they're just casual students of Yip Man, I mean, were these Yip Man's private students? Were these the people who are there all the time? Were these people who are now famous instructors or people who have their own established lineages? Or were these just the dudes who showed up on Monday? All right. And had maybe been there for four or five months. All right. So the problem is when you hear a story like that, um, people will automatically ascribe the, the 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 spin they want to. Oh, well, see, well, obviously Bruce's methods are were so much better. Now Bruce generally taught a very forward pressing style of chi sao, where you have one leg forward and you can press forward. So now imagine you have smaller Chinese students doing chi sao with this bigger Westerner. They've never trained with a Westerner before, who is doing chi sao with one leg forward and pushing into them a lot, and they're not used to it. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Is it a matter of they're inexperienced in green and they haven't learned how to deal with that? Or is that method so much better? So I'm not saying one way or another. The problem is you have to be very careful with listening to a story like that and then going, ah, and knowing exactly what the conclusion of that story is, right? That you take someone who is, who is the dude who went with Bruce to Hong Kong, all right? And Doug Palmer was by no means like Bruce Lee's best Seattle period student. I mean, you obviously had people like Jesse Glover, generally considered the, the best and strongest fighter of all the guys from Seattle. Uh, James DeMille, perhaps the most technically proficient in Chi Sao and, and, and those other methods. And, you know, Ed Hart also having a lot of experience. So you had a lot of guys who were very specialized and very good and perhaps higher up on the food chain than Doug Palmer. But Doug Palmer, from what I understand, was no slouch either, right? And uh, so you're comparing that guy to, uh, you know, it would be like if I just went to Hong Kong and every time only brought Arnell, okay? Oh and it's like, uh, and, and then it's like, you know, so for people who don't know, Arnell is one of my senior students, it's a Filipino dude, 
He's quite thick and stocky yeah. and strong, but he's also very mobile, flexible, and very technical, all right? And so he's been training with me five, six years now, all right? Uh, I bring him with me to Hong Kong, and then you have him train with someone who just does Wing Chun casually in Hong Kong and be like, oh, uh, I'm so much, what I teach is so much better, as opposed to like, this is one of my most dedicated and hard training students up against someone who's just the dude who shows up on Monday, all right? <laughs> so the problem is so like, cool. uh, unless you were there to actually witness it on video, you have to be very careful with what you decide the conclusion is from that story. And also, the thing that people always forget is that Chi Sao is one part of the Wing Chun system. It's a training method that teaches us how to deal with the moment when we have contact with our opponent's arms, which is brief and ephemeral in a real fight. You don't have contact with your partner's arm for that long. And we learn how to react to it, but what do you do with those reactions? You have to put them into sparring, all right? You have to put them into a way where you can now take what you learned in Chisao, and now how do I apply it against someone who's trying to punch and kick me in those moments? So you do all of this Chisao, hours and hours and hours of Chisao to need it for the briefest moments of an exchange in an actual fight. But you have to train it so often so that it sits into the bone, so that it becomes a natural reaction. So you have to train Chisao disproportionately to how much you actually use yeah. it percentage-wise in a fight because it has to be there. The moment you need it, you really need it. And if you don't need it, you go forward and hit. So the mistake people make is they go, okay, let's take this... Wing Chun basically has three main training methods, okay? okay. You have solo training methods, the form, the, the various forms, wall bags, so on and so forth. You have Qi Sao, which is interaction with a partner from contact. And you have some kind of sparring, which is interaction with a partner without pre-contact. And all three of these things are like a Venn diagram. All right. And where all three of them overlap, the skills from your solo training with the skills from Chi Sao, with the skills from training without contact, where they all overlap is in the actual fight. And it's a successful combination of all three of those things, not just one. So, yeah, if you want to just say, OK, this Chi Sao method can run over this Chi Sao method, you're not paying attention to. But how does the whole thing come together? Because if you have to do chi sao and you have to follow someone's rules, like, okay, you got to stick hands this way, stand in this stance, and now watch how I can beat you. Well, in a fight, I don't have to listen to any of those things. Yeah. We start without contact. I can kick the crap out of your knees. I can box your face. No one is telling me, like, okay, I have to get in what stance? Oh, okay, I have to stand like this. I have to put my hands where? Here. Okay, so you have an advantage. Okay, now try to hit you. Oh, of course you can hit me. You literally set up the whole thing yourself, right? Uh -huh. So... Um, I'm not saying one way or another which one is better. I'm just saying you got to pull the reins on what your conclusion is on that because you don't know. The most dedicated guy versus the dude who shows up on Monday. <laughs> all right. And also on looking Monday. at a training method completely divorced of its bigger picture idea and then going like, OK, I mean, if, if I decided that in the middle of cheese out, um, it's acceptable for me to just drop down on my back and put you in a leg lock, like in a John Donaher style leg lock, all right? If we're doing Punzao. Oh, wow. All right? I learned leg locks from Magno, right? Wow. And I just drop them and put you in a leg lock, right? <laughs> wow. I could do that, right? And then I could literally go to any Yip Man student, all right? Or any student of a student of Yip Man in Hong Kong. We go, okay, let's go do Chi Sao. And I drop on my back and put him in a full uh, leg lock or heel hook or something like that and make every single one of them tap out. So is my cheese out method now better? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. All right. So what what the f are we talking about? Okay. All right. So that that that's the problem. You can easily game the system, but that doesn't mean that the thing works cohesively in the whole thing. Would it be logical in the middle of a stand up exchange to just drop and do a leg lock in a street fight? Maybe not. But I could probably get away with it in Punzao if if we're like, hey, we're gonna train cheese out. We have a social contract that this thing is gonna be cheese cheese out, and I just put you in a leg lock and I go, ha. See, I got you. All right, I got you. All right, I won, I won what would drill. be the point? What would be the point? Drill All right, drill winner. That drill winner. I won this drill, bro. All right, you lost this drill, bro. All right, where's my trophy? All right, next question. Next up. <laughs> uh oh. Next up, we got Wing Chun Kung Fu Warsawa. Warsaw. I think that's Warsaw, which is from Poland. Warsaw. Yeah, W A R S A W. Warsaw. Warsaw. 
W-A-R-S-Z-A-R-S-Z-A-R. But it probably has an A in it because it's actually spelled the way they spell it. I got it in W-A-R-S-Z-A-W-A. So I. All right. Okay. There you go. Who knows? His Polish is a little whack today. All right. Are we ready? Yes. What is the difference between Gao Jin Sao from Buji compared to Gao Jin Sao from Wooden Dummy form? Okay. So it should be Gao Jin Gan Sao. Gan Sao. All right. Not just Gao Jin Sao. Not just scissor hands. All right. Like Edward scissor hands. Okay. All right. Gao Jin. Gao Jin is scissors, right? But it's the scissors Gan Sao because Gan Sao is famous movement in Wing Chun. Uh, most people learn it in the very beginning. Sunum Tao Cham Buji, we have the Gan Sao, but that is the lower Gan Sao, which is usually for defending a low line punch or for striking and attacking on a low line. And then you have the high Gan Sao or the high scissor hand, uh, which is for attacking on the high line or defending on the high line. And then when you put the two of them together, uh, it's either called, it's it's one of these movements that has many names, could be called double gansau, high-low gansau, or scissors gansau, depending on your sivu or depending on your sivu's mood that day. I've heard <laughs> Chinese sivus call all three of them in one class, right? Okay. So you have double gansau, high-low gansau, and scissors gansau, oh, right? Oh, man. Now, of course, in um, I can tell from this person's handle, he's a WT person, all right? And WT people, especially WT people in Europe, um, because oftentimes they, there's a disconnect between uh, Sifu Leung Ting, who's the source of their Wing Chun, and whoever it is that taught it to them. And uh, so, for example, in Eastern Europe, sometimes the person who's the go-between between, between Sifu Leung Ting and the other students is basically the person who can decide what information gets doled out. And this is a bit of the problem with so, some of the associations, in my opinion, in particular with his Eastern European association. Because the guys at the top, they're kind of like these guards. And they can decide what the narrative is for their students in terms of what is Buji, what is Wooden Dummy, what is whatever, right? Okay. And so they're basically kind of almost like a blockade between Sifu Leung Teng and what their students learn. So what ends up happening is it's almost like... Um, it's almost like lots of conspiracy theories, right? Well, we have the scissors ganso in the Buji form. That's where the form, that's where the movement traditionally comes in, in, in first into the system, right? If you just want to look at it in terms of the forms as a catalog, where do you see the scissors ganso first? You see it in the Buji form, right? The students may have already learned scissors ganso before they do Buji, but if we're just looking at the forms as a catalog, okay, it, it shows up first in the Buji form. And then again, it shows up in the uh, wooden dummy form. So the natural assumption by many people who don't have access to it is, well, these movements must, there must be something different, mm. right? There must be like a Buji Ganso and then a wooden dummy Ganso. And sometimes with these people who are kind of in charge of holding the information, in, in my opinion, especially in Eastern Europe, they'll go, yeah. And they'll start to create all of these things, right? Like the Buji Scissors Ganso is for this movement. That's why it's done at this angle and it's done this way here and this way here and this way here. But the one in the dummy, you have to go in the other direction and move and change your body. And that's for this and this and this and this. And that's all wow. bullshit. It's all bullshit. Okay. The Scissors Ganso. Sounds not like bullshit. I would, it's, it very sounds... e it's very easy to make it convincing, right? Because why would you why would you have one movement in the form and then it would appear again in another form unless there was some nuance to it or some reason for it, right? Rather than what most of the Wing Chun forms tend to be structured on is high percentage versus low percentage techniques. The movements that are repeated throughout the various forms, again and again, the movements that you see in all three of the fist fighting forms or in if you include the wooden dummy form which is with an apparatus mm. the things that they all do are the highest percentage ideas and movements we have in the system the things that only make an appearance maybe once in this form but not again or mm. once in this form and not again those tend to be the lower percentage situations or techniques right but People are so, like, we're pattern-seeking primates, so we're going to go, well, naturally, the scissors ganso is done differently on the dummy. Yes, because you're doing it on an apparatus, and now you have to adjust it because now you're actually hitting something. Whereas in the Buji form, I can go all the way through because I'm not physically, uh, there, there's there's no um, restriction from an implement in front of me when I'm okay. doing it in the Buji form. Whereas when I do it on the dummy, now I have something in there that's stopping and changing the angle, right? Um, but to think that there is, like, a, super deep secret difference between the wooden dummy scissors ganso and the buji is the kind of rumor that exists only in europe okay hmm. these, these kind of things don't exist in hong kong 
They'll be like, okay, you learn the beauty form. Here's the scissors, ganso. You do it this way. Why do you do it? Because you can do it against this, 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 and this, okay? Now, when you do it on the dummy, you can train your power with the ganso because now we have an apparatus. And in the dummy, we might use the scissors, ganso against some different things, wooden dummy level things, but that doesn't mean the scissors, ganso is inherently different, all right? And if you want to know more about these kind of things, my wooden dummy book is coming out soon. Hey. Yeah, so I just finished the rough draft. It's going to go to this... English speaking gentleman very soon to proofread yes. it and uh, we mean should have me? the uh, no no you're <laughs> you know you, you know you know what Dre you can proofread the pictures all, all right, right? okay there you go. Tell that. me if you like them or not go yay or nay all right I'll let you do that all right Thumbs up. so uh, but no the, we'll, we'll, the Englishman will 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 proofread the English all right and I talk about a lot of these things here and like the abstract concept behind the dummy and how you look at it. And so even if the student who's reading it has not learned the wooden dummy form yet, mm -hmm. there's a lot of gems to be gleamed from that book. Uh, hopefully, if all goes well, we will start the pre-sale at the beginning of December. Of course, we pre-record all of these episodes, so I don't know when this episode is coming out. It's coming so, out in so, January. Yeah, so, so no, 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 I don't, think, no, I, I don't think it's going to be that late. I mean, but this, yeah. this episode could very well come out the first week of December, so literally at the time I'm saying this, uh, the pre-order might be ready to go or it might be another week or two away. So so check on uh, check at citywt.com for details on that. And we'll probably also post some stuff here too. Uh, we will pre-sale all those. We pre-order them. And then when they come in, everyone who gets the first run of them will send those out as soon as they come in. And then the book will be ready. It's 20 pages thicker than the Chum Q book, which was already like my thickest book ever. So it's... Uh, I'm, I'm writing more on these things, not less. All right, so it's not it's not Page the pam Turner. it's not the pamphlet that people are used to that Siva Lang Tang has pumped out in the past. Hey. This is a this is a companion book. This is this is serious. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Next question is TK. Great episode, Alex and team. Great. Uh, we never know what episode they're talking about too, because <laughs> we just copy and paste all these from what whatever they put it right. So I'm sure like, he's talking about all of them. I'll take the compliments. Yes, all right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Question: If it's not been covered before, what are the best exercises in your opinion to build explosive power in your punches slash kicks? Wow, that's a great question. Well, I think even if we did talk about that before, these are the kind of things that we should always talk about, right? right. Because, um, you know, sometimes uh, the questions people ask tend to be very gossipy. What do you think of this guy? Or, you know, what about this? Or talk about this story? Or this guy's better than that guy or whatever. Hypotheticals. Like, and hypotheticals and time machine nonsense, yeah. right? Oh. And I always feel like, like, I'll entertain that stuff. I mean, like, I love the thought experiments of this, that, and the other thing. Or telling irrelevant old stories about kung fu and stuff mm -hmm. but for me i mean the most interesting thing about martial arts training especially chinese kung fu is the improvement all right how do you how do we improve these things we have traditional training methods for this wall bag and other methods to improve our punching and kicking but um you know what can we take from sports science uh to kind of bring it up a notch right and so there are a lot of things so it, it, it's not kind of a straight shot to say okay uh, you do these five things to make your punch more explosive or your kick more explosive because it depends so much on the individual. Remember, everyone is a little bit different genetically. So in terms I'm of not. your, yeah, you're the everyone is different except you. All right, <laughs> I'm the same as everyone. You're the same as everyone. Yeah, the same as everyone. Right? But see, genetically, but that's yeah. the irony. Everyone is different except you. But if you're the exception, that means you're also different. So somehow you're also different, right? So anyway, you know, people have a different distribution of slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers. And that's genetics, right? And usually, depending on what your distribution is, tends to be how your body works, right? So if you have more slow twitch muscle fibers, generally you're the kind of person, and this is extremely general and vague, mm -hmm. admittedly, if you have a lot of slow twitch muscle fibers, you're kind of the person who can go for a long time without getting tired, like um, like a Nate Diaz type person, yeah. right? Okay, you know he's got a kind of lanky body, but he can go for five rounds, and at the end of the fifth round, he'll still have plenty to go, right? Marathon runners, long distance, generally tend to be more slow twitch muscle fiber distribution, right? Um, but the people who really have 
power, like explosive one punch knockout power, tend to have more of a distribution of fast twitch muscle fibers. Now that's not the only factor there too. Um, your ability to punch, like, you know, the, 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 the gift of God they speak, right? Like, you, you know, you just, some people just have that, right? It also has to do with things like limb length and proportions. And you look at things like muscle insertions, where does your bicep insert uh, to your shoulders yeah. and in here, and depending on where those insertions are, that's going to change the leverage on things like your punches. And these are these are things that are out of our ability to change. Where your muscle insertions are, your fast or slow twitch muscle fiber distribution, that's different on everyone. So, so for that reason alone, there is no, okay, do these five things and you're going to, you know, you're going to be more explosive. Because if someone already has good muscle insertions, lots of fast switch muscle fibers they're gonna have that punch with you like sometimes people they just hit something and they're mm. scrawny and they hit it and you go Bleh. like that guy's got power right and, but the person doesn't have a lot of weight or mass or whatever and often you're looking at a combination of you know the fast switch muscle fiber distribution you're looking at where their insertions are and they just they have it they're maybe very sinewy and they have a lot of high ten tendon strength and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but sometimes, not always, those people might gas out a little bit more quickly. All right. So, Damn. you know, they got all that power, but then that power tends to go away kind of more quickly. And other people like that more kind of Nick Diaz body type, they maybe don't have the hardest punch in the world, although I would say most people will probably get knocked the hell out if Nick <laughs> Diaz punched them in the head. Uh, so it's not to say like, oh, that these people don't have any power and they can just go. We're just saying comparatively. Yeah. Um, but they can go for a longer period of time. So you have to kind of figure out which category you are. Now, you might be in slightly different categories for different things. You might have, for example, like I am not a very explosive puncher, all right? Admittedly, um, when I my upper body mass and the way I can punch, I can punch for a long time. Mm -hmm. I have I have kind of like that Nick Diaz, like I can go and hit the heavy bag, da, 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 and go like this. But like that like one punch, like gift from God. I don't have that. All right. Uh, because of my muscle insertions and stuff like that, but I have it on my legs. Mm. All right. I have, I can floor much larger people with my kicks. You've, you've held the kick shield for me yeah, for no, my size. It's not, it's, it, it doesn't feel good. All right. It's not a pleasant. Experience. Yeah. When you take a kick, I've literally launched people in the air with my front thrust kick it, from stationary. It doesn't right? feel like heaven. Yeah. yeah it right. doesn't feel like heaven. Right. Um, because I have a, bigger fast twitch muscle fiber distribution on my legs all right my legs are i don't need to really work out my legs if i don't work out my legs for six months and then i go and do one set of squats yeah. Pfft, yeah. They, they're like huge all right Jeez. because I don't, I, I don't have to do it, but that's genetics all right so if you want a, a leg training program on how to improve your leg strength you probably shouldn't ask me because i have it i, I didn't have to do anything it. for my legs right uh, my upper body on the other hand I have to do a lot more to get what I have, right? So so these things are not even equally distributed among your various body parts, all right? Let alone just, so it's not even like you are just this one type. So you have to figure this out by, you know, doing some strength training, doing some heavy bag training, testing your kicks and punches, doing it for time, doing it for power. And then after a while, you'll start to feel like, you know, am I the kind of person who fades out really quickly mm -hmm. or can I go a little bit longer, but maybe with not as much power? And that's already the baseline you need to start with before you decide how you're going to improve your explosiveness. All right. Uh, so that's why it's very difficult to give kind of a cookie cutter, one size fits all type of answer. Right now, obviously, if you want to train for explosivity, right? The ability to just bomb from, from zero to a hundred very fast with a lot of power, then you're not necessarily going to lift weights for that particular thing. Now I'm not saying then you okay. wouldn't want to lift weights at all, but saying if what you want is explosiveness, then it's not about how much can you bench. Okay. Then you need to actually start training in that kind of way. Yeah. Your, your nervous system is going to make adaptations based on what you're asking it to do. So if you're just trying to lift more in your bench press, 
that kind of slow grinding pushing power, you're not asking your nervous system to become more explosive. All right. Okay. Now, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad. I'm just saying like you are what you train and no more. Mm -hmm. So explos explosiveness then needs to be trained, whether that's through plyometrics, explosive push-ups with claps in between, right? Um, doing, you know, doing explosive punches and then, you know, holding uh, uh, a push-up plank. Uh, so one of the things, it's not necessarily for explosivity, but one of the things that we have to be able to do in order to punch with a little bit more power and for a little bit longer is we have to increase our lactic acid threshold, like how you, how you can withstand lactic acid buildup in your muscles when you're, you know, putting the heat on. And one of the best ways to do that is let's say you're hitting a wall bag or you're hitting a heavy bag, doesn't matter. Um, I'd hit the heavy bag, let's say 15 to 30 seconds. 30 seconds is probably a good time to hit it, all right? Hit it for 30 seconds with as much as you got, as fast and as powerful as you can, which already getting through 30 seconds yeah. is quite a bit, all right? And you're gonna do three minute rounds, right? So for 30 seconds, bah, 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 whether you're doing chain punching or boxing punching or a mix or what, it doesn't matter. You're, you're training your muscles to be more explosive. Go all out. And then after the 30 seconds, you go down into a push-up plank with oh. your arms extended. So you're not gonna do a push-up, you're just gonna go in the push-up position with your arms fully extended. You hold that for 30 seconds because what that does is that traps the lactic acid in your muscles and it doesn't let it flow out like normally you would shake your arms out and let the lactic acid yeah. get out by holding that contracted position you kind of trap it in there so what you're doing is you're making a worst case scenario for your muscles because they cannot get rid of this lactic acid because you're trapping it in there when the 30 seconds is done, you get up and, and you, you hit for another again. 30 seconds, Ooh. right? And you're going to feel like you're just punching through drying cement, right? It's <laughs> going to be all oh, right. But you go for as much explosiveness as you can, 30 seconds, and then hold it for another 30 seconds in the push-up plank. Hit again for 30 seconds and then hold this. it again. So that means that in a three-minute round, you would do each of those three times, all right? Yeah. And then... You know, if it's the first time you're doing it, just do one three minute round, put it at the end of whatever your workout is. Right. Next time, try to go for two rounds. Next time, time, try to go for three. Right. I wouldn't do much more than that because you're going to get diminishing returns. You don't want to you don't want to exhaust yourself, but you want to be able to push yourself a little bit. Now, mind you, that's just one training protocol. There are lots of training protocols that you can use. Right. But I would have to do episode upon episode to give you all sorts of different ones. But that is a start. All right, to become a little bit more explosive, right? And you could even see where you could do parallels with the legs, right? So if you had a, a very nice, heavy, stuffed heavy bag, mm -hmm. you could do like nonstop kicks, right? Like right, left, right, left, right, left, where the, 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 it's keep coming, it, the bag keeps swinging at you and you have to keep the bag suspended in the air, which is one of my favorite exercises to do. We have a teardrop bag upstairs which is like a Muay Thai clinch bag. And that thing is huge and it weighs a lot. Yes, teardrop. And the teardrop bag. And then you kick it with the Wing Chun kick, you, whether front kick or side kick, and you keep it up. And then you have to just alternate right and left and right and left. And you have to keep the bag kind of at a slanted angle so it never goes back down. You do that for 30 seconds. That's extremely explosive. Go down and hold a horse stance for 30 seconds. And you're doing the same thing you did with your arms. Uh, but now you're doing it for your legs, mm. right? Or you, you hit a split squat or something and you do one round on one side, one round on the other. You just hold it. So you trap the lactic acid in your legs and you do it again for a three-minute round, right? And I would start with that. Uh, I talked about Bruce Willow a couple episodes ago. He's uh, uh, not Bruce Willis, who you thought it was. Um, he's another, uh, he's not, another YouTuber. Guy from, okay. And he's the one that does like the Jackie Chan copycat stuff. And, and he does like... He'll take like a training montage from a Kung Fu movie and then he'll recreate it. And he's, you know, like powerful, stocky dude, but he can like do jumps and flips and everything like that. He's from Portugal, I think. Hmm. Uh, if you guys don't follow him already, Bruce Willow on YouTube. The dude's awesome. And uh, he showed, I think, I don't know if he had interviewed a Taekwondo guy or something like that. But a few weeks ago, he, he showed some explosive exercise for training explosivity in your legs. And it was basically being more or less in a squat position and just kind of hopping up and down, but staying in that bottom position. Right. So you're just kind of going pop, 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 up and down while you're in that almost contracted position to kind of develop that pop in your legs. But of course, with those kind of things, you, you can't do that for 10, 20 minutes. You know, you do those things for short rounds or mm. whatever. So a couple little, couple little tips on that.
Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. If you're looking for an easy way to support this podcast, please consider joining the Kung Fu Genius Patreon. You can support for as little as $5 a month and get access to episodes a few days early. Higher levels of support get additional goodies, exclusive content, and even your name in the description. The baller level of support will give you the opportunity to be a Dre for a day and give me a rest from this guy over here. A link for the Kung Fu Genius Patreon page is in the description below. You can also support us by subscribing to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube, liking this video, and sharing it on your social media platforms. When you subscribe on YouTube, don't forget to hit that bell for notifications so you will know as soon as a new episode or a premiere is available for you to watch. For those of us who listen to us on audio, it's a huge help if you don't just rate the podcast, but also write a review wherever you listen to the Kung Fu Genius, such as Apple or Google Podcasts. I really appreciate it. And now back to me. All right. Well, uh, still with TK, he has uh, a Two few questions. Quarter. All right. Good. Secondly, <laughs> I really like the Legend of Bruce Lee TV series, not only because of Danny Chan's interpretation. Why are you shaking your head? Because it's horrible, man. <laughs> it's like someone telling me they like Birth of the Dragon. I just mm, huh? it's hold some vomit inside. Oh. Mm. And I thought the fight scenes were pretty good on the limited budget. But it also explored a lot of the philosophical side to Bruce and his struggles. What are your thoughts on the show? <laughs> How do you rate the opening theme song and Robert Lee's The Ballad of Bruce Lee, which I came across courtesy of the YouTube algorithm? The Ballad of Bruce Lee, which uh, Robert Lee, Bruce's brother, wrote. I think he wrote that already in the 70s. All mm. right, So that's not specific to the show. All right, So we can leave those two things separate like church and state. I have only watched select clips of that Bruce Lee TV show that, that was made in China with Danny Chan. All right, it's multiple parts, right? He did um, like a good 50,000 episodes in that show. N- I, I, I remember mean, like, looking through, it's a lot of through, episodes. Like, Whoa, yeah. what's going on here? So I, I, I almost feel like a broken record whenever it comes to these kind of biopics or these representations of Bruce Lee. I get it. Hollywood and the entertainment industry, whether you're talking about Hong Kong or China, number one job is to make money. Mm. It's not to tell an accurate story. It's not to, you know, these things are not meant to be biographies. It's like I get it. When I, when I, when I push back on how inaccurate the Yip Man movies are, you know, people are like, well, hey, these movies are just made to make money. They're supposed to be entertaining. The number mm. one job of IP Man 1 through 4 is not to to tell the true story of Yip Man in four parts. It's to make money. All right. <laughs> right. And, do, and, you know, and I'm sure the producers would say and do it in the spirit of Yip Man. All right. <laughs> and I get it. I get it. I teach Wing Chun for a living. I have, let's say, a slightly above average interest in these topics, whether it's Bruce Lee or Yip Man or Wing Chun or Hong Kong martial arts or Kung Fu in general. All right. All right. So I'm not like a casual watcher of these things. Right. So for that reason, I tend to look at these things a lot more harshly. All right. Than perhaps I should. So I'm admittedly one of the most biased viewers to these things. Okay. Because my problem with all the Bruce Lee biopics, with the exception of one, Bruce Lee, my brother, they all more or less play Bruce Lee as if he's kind of one of the characters from one of his movies. So they very much blur the lines between like the macho characters Bruce played in his films with what he was like in real life. Now, Bruce, if you read any book about Bruce Lee's life, Uh, whether it's Matt Pauly's book or any of the books there, you will see Bruce lived a tremendously rich life for someone who only made it to 32 years old. Mm -hmm. His childhood growing up in Hong Kong and getting in fights, and he was a child actor, and he was getting kicked out of schools, and he was kind of a bad kid, and then he comes to the States and starts teaching, and he gets challenged, and he does this, that, and the other thing, and he ends up getting a a job in Hollywood as Cato, and then loses that, and then, you know, Steve McQueen, one of the biggest stars at that time becomes his students he's hanging out with roman polanski he goes to hong kong becomes this huge star and then he dies in 32 years he's not that boring guy you see like, no randomly no, so this guy's when you actually look at bruce's life without any embellishment there are so many things 
you could talk about and make movies about and follow and study without having to just, I mean, obviously, look, when you make a film, you have to have three acts in a movie, you know, it has to come to some kind of resolution. I get it. There are limits to the medium of film, which require, you know, the 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 story, the, the storyboard to move in a certain way in order for this thing to kind of wrap up at the end. That's less of an issue with TV, because now TV, you can tell the, the story over numerous episodes or numerous seasons, all right? So TV doesn't have that limitation that a movie has. <laughs> if you get picked up for a second season, a third season. Exactly, right? right? But even if you only get one season, you mm. can tell much more of a story uh, in 12 episodes than you can in one film, yeah. all right? Because if each episode is an hour, you know, so you have, that's 12, 12 hours, hours, all right? As opposed to two hours, you can tell a lot more story. Imagine, I don't know if you've seen Squid Game, but it's awesome. Not yet. All right. Not yet. But you. But I was just thinking, like, you could never make Squid Game a movie because there's so much you need to tell. You it needs to be a TV series, right? Gotcha. So um, now they actually make a TV series. But the problem is, this TV series is made, or was made. I mean, it's already a number of years old. This isn't even new. It was made in mainland China. In mainland China, they have a lot of restrictive laws in terms of what can be shown and how people can be portrayed, and they have to everything has to pass all of these censorship boards and things like that. And honestly, Bruce Lee is very culturally is uniquely a mixture of two very powerful cultures. Hong Kong Chinese culture, which is not the same as mainland Chinese culture, all mm. right? And most Hong Kong and even mainland Chinese will agree with me. Hong Kong is culturally different from mainland China, all right? For they were not a communist country for, for all those years, and they still maintained a lot of the traditional roots, right? But also because of the British influence, they have a lot of infusion of, of European influence in there as well. So Hong Kong is its own unique culture. It has obviously rooted traditional Chinese culture, but it is very different from mainland China, very different culturally. Wow. And Bruce also grew up here in the States, okay? So you either go and take an American view of how he did things or you take a Hong Kong Chinese perspective. But now we have a mainland China perspective, which is just to make everything big and sensational and over the top. And wow. everything gets lost in translation with that, right? And so I saw a few clips from that TV series. And Danny, you know, Danny Chan, who who played the goalie in Shaolin Soccer, he has that Bruce Lee shtick down. He plays he plays Bruce Lee in Yip Man 4, all yeah. right, which is like he's supposed to be a 20-something-year-old Bruce Lee. Danny <laughs> Chan is older than me. At some point, he needs to fire his agent. He's like, you know, I'm 45 years old. I'm yeah. playing a 22-year-old Bruce Lee. Uh -huh. Can you maybe get me another gig, all right? Um, you know, it, it's getting kind of ridiculous because he's looking a little long in the tooth for someone who died at 32, all right? So my issue is this. One, you I shouldn't I, even be playing a 32 year old. No, Bruce. not even not even <laughs> Bruce hanging out with Betty. He's getting a little too old for that, right? Damn. And so so I go, all right, first of all, it's a mainland Chinese series, so it's gonna be over the top. All the foreign characters, whether they're white or black, are all gonna be a caricature of any human being that's ever lived. All right. Uh, you know, when you look in films that are done in China when they portray black people or Europeans or whatever, and I'm not defending European behavior in China, but it's like, you, you know, in Hong Kong, they have a saying for like the Brits who, who end up in Hong Kong, right? And they call them filth, which is failed in London, try Hong Kong, all right? <laughs> From the time when, when they were still a British col colony, right? So, okay. so you had, uh, I mean, this is not always, they are beautiful British people in Hong Kong still yeah. to this day. But you also have some people that like maybe couldn't make it back there and then yeah. they were, had a chance to make it in Hong Kong, right? Well, when you look at the foreign actors who make it in China, it's because they cannot make it in Europe and they cannot make it in America, right? So sometimes you look at these dudes and you go, this guy wouldn't be hired to do a Crest commercial oh. in the U.S. and he's starring in a film, right? So the, all the foreign actors are horrible, okay? And then they got Ray Park to play Chuck Nor the Chuck Norris character, but they can't even use the name Chuck Norris because, of I don't know, China just doesn't want to deal with it or whatever. Ray Park is the guy who played uh, Darth Maul. 
All right. Yeah. yeah, he plays like the Chuck Norris character or something like that. In, in so, this, okay. in, in this stupid series. So All I right. watched a couple of the episodes. I gotta see that. Though. I watched a couple of the episodes. Uh, no, I didn't watch a couple of the episodes. Sorry, I watched a couple of clips mm -hmm. from a few different episodes. Quick question. Yeah. Does Ray Park have a, an American accent in it? I don't remember. And I don't think it would even matter if he did or not. No, it's just that Ray Park comes from very close to where I used to live in London. Mm. Like, and there is a very specific... He, he also suffered the... the reason why, one of the reasons why Darth Maul doesn't speak in The Phantom Menace is yeah. because of his accent. Because he like, sounds like you. He sounds way worse than you. <laughs> <laughs> He's oh, like, oh, right, mate, how are you doing? Like, right, right, right. Just, like, yeah, you can imagine Darth Maul like, kind of delivering some... like. It would no, kill Sky his Walker. his sphere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Skywalker. Skywalker. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> yeah, so like you know, so, so, wow. so I saw a couple clips of it and I just this is garbage. All right. Mm -hmm. This is absolute garbage. Because one, it's made in China, so it's already automatically gonna be sensational and Bruce Lee is a back flipping, you know, dude from the films. Two, Bruce Lee's real life story is so compelling. Why do they need to make shit up? All right. You can embellish it and make a screen, but you there's so many things that really happened. Right. And I know about Bruce Lee's philosophy like anyone else who followed him. Right. You can read it in his books. Okay. You can even look at the books that Bruce Lee read. It will be a cold day in hell before I need to watch a TV series from mainland China to explore the philosophies of the real Bruce Lee. Dude, you can literally buy the books that were published by John Little, the mm -hmm. Bruce Lee estate, and read Bruce's notes. Yeah. Why do I need a film, a TV series from China to go like, oh, it really talks about his philosophy. Are you kidding me? I'm, I just feel so pandered to every time. Don't, let me get, did he say to be like water in there? I mean, <laughs> come on, like, no. let's get over this crap already, all right? And, and, and it's, you know, of course, the irony is that this thing, of course, was endorsed by the Lee estate, because the more inaccurate it is, the more likely the Lee estate will actually endorse it. Yeah. Man. Oh, All right, man. what else we got? Wow. Next up, we got the panda. The panda. The panda. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy listening to these podcasts. What's funny is I put a space, so I, I didn't know there was a question coming. I'll just, like, put a space. <laughs> I thought that was the Oh, that was question. it? I really like these podcasts. Yeah, well, thank you, it. the panda. Next one, right? <laughs> All right. But he does have a question. Question. For a newbie trying to learn Wing Chun and looking for a local WT school to train with, what qualities, attributes, red flags would you look for when considering the school? Okay. So he's asking me specifically about WT, all right? Yes. Which is the learning lineage from which I Definitely originally come from. Definitely spelled it with the WT. Okay, so yeah. WT. For, <laughs> WT. Uh, so for, yeah, for those out there who've just come from other Wing Chun lineages, I, I apologize, it's very WT specific. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I left the WT Association now over 10 years ago, right? So it's almost like a political question at this point for me, right? Um, WT is was one of the largest... We love politics. We love politics, right? Yeah. WT is one of the largest, uh, let's say, representations of Yip Man Wing Chun lineage out there, right? Um, and, you know, you have uh, Leung Sung and Tsai Sung Tin and Wong Sun Leung and uh, Ho Ka Ming and... Mo Yat and uh, Tu Wan and, uh, you know, Leung Ting, William Chung, all these famous lineages, right? And so Leung Ting lineage generally go by the WT spelling. And so the question is, like, he's looking specifically for one. Well, one, if you're looking in the States, uh, you're probably, you're SOL, or right? shit out of luck. <laughs> because th there's not that many WT schools here. The d WT really exploded in Europe for a number of reasons, which I've discussed before, mm -hmm. historically, and so on and so forth. So, you know, you're more likely to find WT or a WT offshoot in Europe than you are in the States, because even at the height of, WT, which is very difficult to find when was the height of it here, whether it was before Sifu Emin took over in the 90s and it was like uh, uh, Robert Jacquet and those guys, even when at that time they didn't have that many schools. You had a couple of schools in Texas, a couple of schools in California, mm. here, there, whatever, but it wasn't like every town you had a school. And then under Sifu Emin, there were maybe some more schools here and there, but 
most of those have since dissolved, right? And then under the IWTA NAS, when I was there, a lot of those schools have dissolved. They don't really have a whole lot going on. And many of those schools are not like brick and mortar professional schools. So if it's in the States, you, statistically speaking, you're probably not going to find a WT school in your, you know, your neighborhood WT school, not like in Germany, for example. So, uh, so having said that, that's already the first hurdle you have. But when people always ask me what to look for in a school, look, you got to like it. All right. So <laughs> you go to a school, you meet the instructor, you see the place. And do you vibe with this place? Do you like what the person is saying? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel this is a place where you can learn something? Um, ultimately, no matter how much you think your reasoning is logical for why you join a school, well, I'm doing Wing Chun because it's you know self-defense practical or the Sifu learn from so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. You give yourself these logical reasons. That's your, your post hoc justification for why you join. But the real reason why you join is because you come in and you go like, yeah, I can see myself in this place. It's 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 emotional. We we often purchase yeah. most most purchases are emotional, like purchasing right? a car. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, just make sure you don't Alexis. get yeah, make sure you don't get a phony uh, um, luxury car. <laughs> The Japanese All right. Mercedes. <laughs> it's not what? a Japanese Mercedes. <laughs> All right. It's a Toyota posing as a way. luxury you car. Put it up all the way up. All right. <laughs> all right. What do you call a Lexus in Japan? <laughs> a Toyota, because that's what it is. All right. Okay. For those of you who don't know, Dre just got his license finally at age 67. Right, right, Finally right. passed his driver's license. Finally. So he's looking, well, no, looking finally for, took it. Yeah, finally took it. Took it. And... Uh, was looking to get a, a fancy car and <laughs> anyway Boy, i'm a little just... i'm a little partial towards european cars but that's an, another episode yeah, so anyway uh yeah so um do you like the school do you like the place does it seem like somewhere where you can kind of vibe do the students look like they're having fun or do they look like a bunch of whip dogs who are afraid of the instructor oh. all right um and that's it and that's a feeling i cannot you cannot quantify that I could give you a checklist mm -hmm. of what's good and bad in a school and you could walk into the school and like it even if all those things on the checklist are wrong and hate it even if all those things on the checklist are right. So, so ultimately... One of the red flags will be if you walk into a school and everyone got black eyes. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's a right? red flag. Every right time there. the instructor comes in, everyone's like, oh, <laughs> right? Yeah, then I'd be like, nah, maybe not. All right? One of the red flags is you walk into a school and everyone's holding red flags. <laughs> everyone's oh, holding God red flags. Yeah. <laughs> then definitely leave if everyone's holding red flags. <laughs> all right, cool. What else we got? All right. We got GBUK101. Another great episode. Great. I thought right. so too. I don't know which episode though. But. A question for an AMA episode. All right. That's this. Is there one specific light bulb moment you can recollect in your training that you've had about your Sifu that you took as confirmation that you had made the right choice? in your selection of martial arts school and teacher? Uh, mm, yeah, that's interesting. Um, no, actually. No, there wasn't that's a light bulb pretty moment. Pretty wild. Um, well, you know what it is? I, I'm, I'm very stubborn, all right? Pe I have a light bulb moment. Okay. <laughs> I'll ask you about that in a moment. <laughs> no, because for me... You know, martial arts has been an obsession of mine since I was eight years old. Okay. I started with Taekwondo and karate, but through the magazines and seeing films, I, I wanted to do Kung Fu or something Bruce Lee related or Wing Chun related. And then when I had the chance to see Wing Chun as a teenager, I was like, wow, this is the thing that I had been waiting for, right? I already had a black belt in Taekwondo, but it was like, wow, this is, this is like the thing. So maybe that was the moment when I met Sifu Johan. I was like, wow, Wing Chun, Kung Fu, whatever. Like that happened very early on. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm very disciplined and dedicated to the things that I really want to follow. So I wasn't like floundering for the first few years going like, well, I'm still not sure if this is correct or not. Right. I was like, yeah. no, I told like, I just went, I just dived head mm. first. Right. Damn. And so there wasn't like, there wasn't this moment because I, uh, I just went into it right away. Now, some people might say, well, does that mean maybe you weren't as critical about what I was learning because I was just like, I was so into it, right? And there is certainly an aspect to that. But if 
you don't really fully embrace something and go for it. You're never really going to have a chance to see what it's all about. Like there are people who are naturally very skeptical and that is a very healthy position to have, right? Like you're not sure or whatever and you want to find out. But what ends up happening sometimes with people who are like that is they will take on a new pursuit, whether it's Wing Chun or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or whatever, with one foot in the door and one foot out. Mm. And th that is no way to see if that's something that you really, really want to do. For me, it's like you got to go all in, really get into it, read everything you can about that subject, learn everything you can, really study and do everything you can to get good at it. And when you've done it for a while and you feel like you're starting to get a little bit of a hang of it, then you can start to go, okay, now where can we be critical about what we're doing? The problem is when people, in my opinion, are critical too early, and I don't mean like blindly accepting what a Sifu says, because that, that's also a problem, blindly accepting whatever your new cult is telling you to do. <laughs> I'm just saying like, if you're going to do this new martial art. I love cults. All right. Yeah. If you're going to do, I can tell by the way you're dressed, you look yes. like you're passing out pamphlets for something, right? <laughs> Passed out 400 on yeah, the way yeah. here. Have you, have you heard about the spaceship that's coming to save us all? All right. Well, let me tell you about it, right? A clean stack. Do you, do you like my wins or not? I don't. <laughs> All right? <laughs> he botched his knot. He botched that knot. It was better before when the actual Englishman went, did it. I went from half to full nitwit knot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for me, I didn't have like this one moment because I went all in. What I did is I really got into it. And then over time... Mm -hmm. I, I could start to look a little critically about, okay, how can I improve certain methods of how I teach it or how I practice it or how I do it or how, what do other people do or whatever. But that comes through a constant uh, mindset of exploration. Mm -hmm. But it, had I just been like, well, I'm going to kind of try, kind of do, kind of whatever. Uh, I, I don't think you earned that light bulb moment because you, you, you never really em embrace it enough to actually have that moment happen. Mm. Sad. You said you had a moment. Oh, oh, shit. Well, I mean, of course, I got signed up by my awesome CJ. And she was my trainer on Saturdays. Uh -huh. Okay. And I was only getting here for lunch classes during the week, which mm -hmm. was with my Seahang Caillou. Oh, Caillou. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, phenomenal yeah. martial artist or phenomenal just uh, uh, someone who can move. Yes, so athletically you're just right. like i want to do that right and then eventually i made it to an evening class with yeah. my c hang craig mm -hmm. and i'm just like this one. it's like the sith right right he's a sith -ish. everyone is yeah. different here yeah. yeah yeah this guy's sith. nicole is one way yeah yeah caillou is another yeah. way craig's one way he's yeah just, he's just yeah. like the f what's happening right i'm gonna right. get killed right he's now? using dark skills yeah yeah and then and then i think the itc first uh itc came up for me and you're teaching the whole itc i've been to maybe one class before that with you and oh, that really? was in the night oh in the evening at the so, very beginning yeah this was like in my f before right. i became a uh fourth level uh, -huh. uh student fourth right? grade right. student right and uh itc comes around and and you're you're just grabbing people at the end of the ITC, and and you're just throwing them around and all that, and uh, it, you grab me out of nowhere and you, you toss me around. But it was so weird that I'm I'm just all over the place getting getting manhandled, which I've never had happen to me, manhandled, <laughs> and every every time you hit me, I didn't know where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was happening in that moment and i was so f like present right but uh, ooh, ah, uh, 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 and and i leave i'm like that was some magic dark magic shit right there <laughs> like it, it just it was just it's magician funny. i have no recollection yeah, of that moment it, it was a magician <laughs> at, at, i have one dark magic moment that oh. will forever stick with me and mm -hmm. this was when seagong was um showing us the first attack and i can't remember whether i was still gray shirt at the time i uh -huh. think i was it's definitely gray shirt right. i'm pretty sure i'm still gray shirt <laughs> yeah and then you know so the first thing is obviously it's like, -pow, like super fast I'm like, yeah. yeah okay i'm not gonna get because no, <laughs> i'm no, not no. gonna let this let happen just, again let me just slow it down uh, for you right uh -huh. and i just remember both myself and seth from brooklyn were in the same yeah. position where we were like we watched him just watch the hand do it we're gonna do that and then the next thing you know we're against the wall i'm like how the f did you just do that 
Like, what was the trick? Like, we literally. But it's magic, though. It's the trick. It just seems like. The thing is. Sleight of hand, everything. Later on, we. Did actually tell us what the trick was. Uh-huh. Not that that made any difference, yeah, but right, like right, kind right, of yeah. like it's just like yeah, just go <laughs> boom. I'm like, <laughs> he hell, does it yeah. hella cool. slow for you. And I'm then, gonna. By the way, I'm gonna give you guys your tips later for totally propping me up in this no. episode. <laughs> 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 this is a shiny one for each of you no, guys. But it was it was so mind blowing, in in in, in that moment that I went off to the side and I watched other people get thrown around, but I'm just like, I'm just trying to see how you're doing it. Because my grandfather always told me, oh, you want to learn something, just watch. Uh-huh. Just watch. Uh-huh. That's all you got to do. And I'm watching. And I'm watching. And I still don't know how to fuck you do it. <laughs> <laughs> to this day. I've been watching this day. I lived with the guy for about a year. I was That's watching right. him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, like a stalker. That's right. You live with me for a year. People don't know that, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you saw my weird <laughs> Just going back routines. to something you said a second ago. That's yeah. because, like, you know, with the Sith, there mm-hmm. is a master and an apprentice. Yes. And Craig's my seafood, yeah. but he is a Sith apprentice. He is a <laughs> Sith. That's Sith what, Lord Sith right Lord here. Over there. Yeah, yeah. All right, enough puffing me up. Let's go to the next question. <laughs> next question. <laughs> <laughs> Burial Daniel. Burial. Oh, Barrier. Barrier. Yeah, like Perrier. Perrier. Yeah. Perrier, Daniel. It's French. <laughs> hey, guys. Exclamation. What do you think about the WC community's infatuation for Escrima Kali? I've seen a lot of JJB enthusiasts. I think that's BJJ. I think he got I, it backwards. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what can I, I say? JJB enthusiasts. JJB. Yeah, JJB. Yeah. Jiu Jitsu Brazilian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ju- or Juju <laughs> Beans. Juju Beans. If it's French, then absolutely would be JJB. Yes, that's right. I've seen a lot of JJB enthusiasts among way, uh, WC practitioners, probably due to the lack of ground fighting techniques in WC, but why Escrima and not TKD or boxing? Maybe. The Dan and Asanto and JKD heritage. I have nothing against Escrima. I'm just curious because I've seen many WC coons with Escrima classes. Yourself, did you try it? Thanks for your awesome show. Boom, boom, boom. Wow. Three of those. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, so um, that's a good question. I mean, historically, the reason why Escrima was part of WT in Europe, all right, not elsewhere. Mm. Um, was because of a friendship between Sifu Kanchbecht and Rene Latoza, who is a a screamer master of a number of different Filipino martial arts from Stockton, California. And so uh, they had a friendship, and he brought him over to Germany. Part of the reason is that, because for historical reasons, I mean, now nowadays with social media, uh, you get the impression that everyone who does Wing Chun knows the dummy, knows the pole, knows the knives. But <laughs> that, that wasn't necessarily the case. I mean, Grandmaster Yip Man did not teach the knife and the pole and even all of the dummy to all of his students. But you would be hard-pressed to know that when you look at all these Wing Chun superstars on social media um, because you think, oh, everyone knows everyone. And if someone is twirling around some bacham do, that must mean this is the Wing Chun bacham do as opposed to just a bunch of made up shit or copied shit or copy and paste shit. Mm. Right. And uh, it's also interesting because a lot of the people who are really big on like Instagram, these like Wing Chun celebrities, these are they're like almost grown in a lab outside of the world of like people who are like established martial arts or Wing Chun practitioners. Mm-hmm. So when you think of the people who actually, you know, represent Yip Man Wing Chun to a certain degree, you're looking at Lang Sang Lineage, Choi Shang Tin, Lang Tang, Wong Sang Lang, yada, yada, yada. Like I listed them before. And they would be from one of those lineages. And then you go on Instagram and you see all these like Wing Chun guys doing all these sped up demos and all this kind of stuff. And you go like, who are these people even coming from? And you'll find they're not necessarily from any kind of lineage or anything like that. And you go like, these are just social media people, right? Okay. And so you look at that stuff and you get the impression like, oh, it's all it's all the same whatever, right? But in reality, not all of the students of Yip Man learn the weapons. And if we look at it... Um, learning how to fight with a nine foot or eight and a half foot long pole 
is not the most pressing for your personal safety in terms of like, you know, you're you're going home on the subway one night and then, mm. you know, you get cornered and you need to defend yourself. All right. Okay. Um, and it, the pacham do, the double knives, uh, as cool and badass as they are, also don't necessarily represent weapons that you're going to be using on a regular basis, right? And I know people are like, oh, well, it's like you can do the same thing like with two sticks with the two knives. Yeah, 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 no, okay? I, I get it, but it's also, that's just kind of forcing a square peg into a round hole a little bit, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at it just in terms of like practical safety, all right, is it a Qing dynasty developed technique with an eight and a half foot pole uh, or these two short knives, uh, the most kind of practical thing to learn. And I would say, well, not from a safety perspective. Now, obviously, if you practice Wing Chun seriously, you're going to want to learn these things because they're part of the system and they're keys to learning and completing and understanding what Wing Chun is about. Mm. And I think anyone who has been doing Wing Chun long enough to be eligible to learn the long pole if they're going, well, I'm still not sure why I would have to learn a long pole. <laughs> if, if you've been doing Wing Chun for that long, <laughs> no, but here, I tell you, in the WT organization, wow. all right, there was a dude in Chicago, all right, way back in the day, he was like, I don't really understand why we have to learn the long pole because you know, am I really going to get attacked where well, I'm going to need something like that. And mind you, in WT, by the time you learn long pole, usually you finish the, like the, let's say, the in the old days, you finish the wooden dummy. Yeah. And I just remember the guy said that to me. He was also Chinese. And I was like, <laughs> I just looked at him. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Puzzled. You've been doing this that long? Uh -huh. And your number one concern is your personal safety and your ability to apply that to weapons. And then going, this is probably not the most practical weapon to learn. And I was just going like, what wow. steps has your Sifu missed in terms of like <laughs> teaching you, right? Uh -huh. Anyone who decides they're going to dedicate their entire life to a martial art for personal protection cannot be doing it for a cost-benefit analysis that's favorable, all right? Let's say you even want to go the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu route and get really good at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for personal protection. Yeah. How many hours do you have to practice Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to really get good and competent for practical fighting? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of hours. How many fights or assaults do you expect to be in for the rest of your life? Let's say conservatively you think, Maybe and it's 60. different. It's different for everyone. Well, you maybe right. Your job right, but you know m maybe you know average person that has a desk job. Mm -hmm. Let's like, say like me. On, yeah, let's on say other days. Yeah, on other days, right? Let's say two. Let's say two altercations uh, in the rest in of your life. lifetime. In the yeah, rest of your life. Right. All right. If you had a, like a normal like my dad, all right, <laughs> all right. My dad will never get an altercation in his life. But let's. I'll give him the two. Oh god. Okay. So is it worth for my dad? <laughs> to train hours and hours and hours and hours of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or hours and hours and hours of boxing or hours and hours and hours and hours of Wing Chun. But he skips the leg locks. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> for, for let's say, you're in two altercations. So we're talking about a self-defense situation, mm -hmm. right? You know, someone someone gets in your face at a bar and do, 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 and then the bouncers come in and then you can swear to what, 15 seconds? I would love to All see right? my dad do that. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe again, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, depending on what's going on. So we're talking about two altercations, not even one minute of your life. Mm. Unless you're talking about like running away from a bunch of people chasing you in which you don't have any chance anyway. But let's, let's say for one minute of your life for two fights. Mm. So how is anyone looking at training any martial art? favorably in a cost benefit. And why do we do this? We do this shit because we love it, because right. it's awesome, because it's so much fun. You do boxing, like, like you know, Wing Chun people or other martial arts good, want to go to Tai Chi people. You can't use that Tai Chi crap in a fight, all right? Self-discovery. You know? and, and then meanwhile, like the Tai Chi person is there doing the form <laughs> and you're going like, man, how are we going to do that if someone goes for a double leg takedown and the Tai Chi person gives zero shits? Yeah. You know why? Because they enjoy it, yeah. right? Or, you know, the guy's there doing, you know, a very traditional Chinese kung fu form. You go like, you know what? You're not really ag addressing, uh, you know, what to do against a good boxer. And that guy whipping his form and weapons and stuff like that gives zero shits because they enjoy doing that. And the person who's really awesome at boxing go, hey, man, what if someone kicks you? Gives zero shits because they love boxing. All mm -hmm. right. So none of this is about a logical choice of a cost-benefit analysis, all right? Because if you're really just talking about self-protection and you do the math, no martial art makes <laughs> sense, all right? No martial art makes sense. You do it because it's an awesome pursuit. Martial arts give you a, 
uh, a way to get in shape that's not just like going to the gym and being bored. It gives you a way to interact and deal with conflict, which is not always physical. It's often verbal. But the things that you learn from any martial art can easily be applied to verbal strategies and things like that. It also shows you how to uh, develop a uh, bigger picture progress. You are here, you want to go here, whether in jujitsu that might be getting a black belt or in Wing Chun that might be to finally learn the wooden dummy or to learn how to do this or whatever. You have your big picture goal. And then how do I get there? I do it in little bite-sized goals, little mini goals working my way there. That type of strategy that you learn through martial arts, regardless of what martial art it is, is extremely powerful in terms of you being able to achieve goals in your life outside of martial arts. So what martial arts can potentially give you as a human being far outweigh the self-defense practical fighting aspect. Because if you're really that way, you freaking buy a gun or a taser or mm. something, right? Or hire a bodyguard. All right. Like it, 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 it doesn't make sense. So when people are like, you know, what where would I learn the long pole and the knives? Uh, you're going to get in a fight with it. Dude, M -er, you're not going to get in a fight, period. So shut up, okay? Shut up, okay? So, st so stop, okay? Stop, all right? And, and, and so there's that issue. So having said all of that as my preamble, because the weapons come very late in Wing Chun, historically, I mean, not if you look at the, all the IG superstars flipping nonsense knives, uh, and maybe those two weapons don't necessarily translate one-to-one -to, -one to what you're going to need in the street, brah. Uh, then Filipino martial arts are the perfect um, stopgap measure for that, okay? Because in Filipino martial arts, you learn how to use a stick, all right? Like a single a scream a stick, a rattan stick. And the skills you learn with a stick are one-to-one -one transferable to pretty much any found weapon you would kind of find on the street, right? Mm. So you learn how to fight with an Eskrima stick. That could easily be an umbrella that you have in your hands, all right? That could easily be uh, a baseball bat or whatever you're able to find, a lead pipe if you're in a back alley, right? Yeah. So it's pretty easy to see why Eskrima skills are extremely transferable to practical street fighting because the things you learn in Eskrima are can easily be related to found weapons, not just weapons that you happen to be carrying on you, right? So you learn how to fight with a single stick or with two sticks. And some people teach knives and stuff like that. So you're getting competency in the kinds of weapons that more than likely are going to be in an attacker's hand. And so that then gives you a more practical... Uh, I, although it's like, yeah, because you learn to scream out, yeah, you really think you're going to get in a knife fight on the street? You're insane. Get out of here. Shut up. You do that stuff too because you like it, all right? I don't care. You can do 10 years of all that knife stuff or whatever, and someone pulls a knife on you in, in the street for real life, you're going to crap your pants, all right? <laughs> so let's not pretend like that bestows you any. We do this stuff because we love it. Right. And only like the people at the highest levels who are absolute freaks about this stuff really have a chance to really do that stuff in, in, in those situations, right? So Eskrima was, you know, whether it's from the JKD side, because obviously Dan and Asanto being – Filipino had an affinity for those martial arts and brought it in. And uh, in the EWTO, because of the relationship with Rene Latoza, they brought that in. And then that gave Wing Chun people a weapon to train uh, while they were essentially waiting to learn the Wing Chun weapons. Mm -hmm. All right. And so that was kind of the reason. All right. I have tried Eskrima. I think it's great. And, and we do K3 uh, from Dr. Mark Chang here, which is uh, Filipino martial arts, but it's actually more for movement to improve the way you move and coordination and stuff like that. But obviously those things are, one, are absolutely transferable to practical fighting. So we do some of that stuff here. We don't specialize in it. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's great. I don't see a problem with it. Sifu Lang Ting absolutely hated Eskrima. Mm. He thought that, you know, my Sifu putting Eskrima, you know, was kind of a, a secondary martial art that you can learn in the EWTO. I mean, he tolerated it because the EWTO made him a lot of money. But I'll tell you with private conversations I had with him, he absolutely effing hated it. Wow. Effing hated it. Okay. And uh, But that's because he felt like, hey, it's a Wing Chun organization. Why is there – Wing Chun organization, there's an A choice. There's not an A and a B choice. <laughs> And so he felt like his European organization is giving people an A and a B choice. And okay. he's like, the B is not the A. Mm -hmm. So from a traditional standpoint, I, I get why he feels that way, right? But the European Wing Chun organization is very practical, very pragmatic, very forward thinking, right? So they do what they had to do to make the thing work. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. One more question? 
I think we have time for one more. If, All right, uh, let's do if it. If we may. Uh, next up, we got Dryzen. And Dryzen is asking a uh, hypothetical. And he's asking, hey, guys, really love your podcast. Keep up the great work, especially that Dre guy. Wow. 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 Wait a minute. And I'm pretty sure he said most of this just while looking at me straight in the eyes. So yeah. he's not even reading this stuff. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. I get it. It's cool. It's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. What is, what is Dreyson have? I don't know what, what, what he's referring to. Yeah. Know. Yeah. You don't know. Yeah. Especially. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, right. moving right along. Got it. <laughs> All right. Let's You're go. Right there. Did you even write a question this time? <laughs> I, yeah, I have it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, and he asks, uh, hypothetical. All right, one day you wake up and your wife bursts into the room. Let's get dressed. Time to go. All right. Sounds like a very likely scenario. Right. Yeah, I oversleep. Yeah. yeah. Get dressed. Time to go. Okay. And pack some stuff in your suitcase. Okay. That was bizarre. Yeah. My wife doesn't do anything yeah. without massive planning, by the way. She says, I have a surpri <laughs> so surprise. So now come to think of it, this would never happen. But... I have a surprise for you. Oh, that would never happen. Yeah. All right. All right. This is very hypothetical. Mm -hmm. I, I, I freed up your schedule for the next week. Okay. Your parents are coming to watch the kids. Okay. For the week. Okay. I'm taking you on a surprise vacay. You, know, you deserve he hasn't it. Actually, broken eye contact with you. Yeah, I know. I no, know. it's it, right here. Yeah, no, it's, it's right, right here. Okay, yeah, it's right there. I get it. Okay, it's right uh, here. Okay, it's right, right here. Yeah, yes, right. Mm -hmm. and then I'm taking you on a surprise vacay. You're like, what? Okay, what do you mean surprise vacay? Where uh -huh. are we going? Hong Kong? He's like, no, 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 somewhere tropical. You're like, what? What do you mean, like Aruba, Jamaica? You like? She's like, no, 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 no. Don't worry. Don't ask too many questions. What? What, what do you mean? Okay, my wife is doing this. Yeah. You've met my wife. This is so unlike her. You know? No, I get Dreyson writing the like, question. You're like, you're like, what? Wait, come on, babe. Okay. Tell me. All right, let's go. Bermuda, Bahamas. Come on, pretty come mama. On, pretty mama. All right, let's go. Let's Key go. Lago, come on. Montego. Where are we going? All right. And you get on the plane. You still don't know where you're going. Even though it usually says at the terminal what right. plane you're you getting on. Right? She blindfolds oh, she blindfolds you. Yeah, got yeah, it. Got yeah, it. Of it's course. convenient. Yeah. Of course. Some squid game shit here. <laughs> All right, let's go. So you land. Uh huh. You're in Aruba. Okay. All right. You're like, wow. All right. Never been to Aruba. This is dope. Uh huh. Dope. I say that right when I get out yeah. of the place. This is dope. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Simo. This is dope. Uh -huh. I mean, Carol, you call yeah. her. You don't call her Simo. No, nah, I wouldn't call her ah, Simo because yeah, yeah. she's not my Simo. Right, exactly. Right. You wouldn't call her that. Yeah. That would be weird. That would be weird. Yeah. So y'all chilling now on the beach, relaxing, out chilling. Yeah. Cooling. And uh, you're drinking pina coladas. It's also not like me. Right? Drink yeah. a pina colada. Yeah. Wifey's like, this is so dope, right? You love it. Uh -huh. My wife would, those words would never come out of my wife's mouth. <laughs> this is great. This is so dope. Is, right, right. Yeah, she would never say that. And then, you know, you finish the pina colada. Then you're like, damn, I want another one. You want another round? This does Honey? not sound like you It doesn't at sound all. like me at all. I can, totally you. It takes me an totally hour to you. drink one beer, all right? And first, and totally so you. three quarters of a beer, and then he becomes rather talkative. That's right. <laughs> well, you're both ready for another round. Okay. Okay. I'm ready for another round. I'll I'm ready for another round. Yeah. yeah. Wait, and five <laughs> minutes in, the question hasn't even come yet. <laughs> and then, all of a sudden, some dude comes over, takes the drinks. Not the guy who brought the drinks, but another different dude with uh -huh. a hat. Uh-huh. Were the drinks finished or did he come? Drinks are finished. Okay. And you're like, hey, can we order more drinks with you? I spent a year here one right? afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you ask the guy, can, can we order more drinks with you? And he's uh -huh. like, sorry, sir, you know, um, but you got to order from the server, the waiter. He'll be by in a second. Okay. But if, if you want another round of pina coladas, maybe I can Jesus let him know. Christ, God, can we right? just get to it? Jesus Christ. So right? Jesus Christ. But, but you, you're, you're bugging because you, the guy walks away and you're like, wait. He sounds familiar. <laughs> he sounds really familiar. Oh Did you hear his voice? She's like, no, I, don't, I didn't notice anything. And then the guy walks by. He has his hat. You can't see his face too much. I'm getting so angry right just, now. You can't I see his face. I'm so angry inside right now. But you got more pina coladas now. Oh my God. You got more pina coladas. Oh my God. Spit it out. Waiter comes Spit over. Spit it out. And you look at the guy again. 
And you're like, oh my God. Each rehearsal you're like, Carol, I think, I think that's Bruce. I think that's Bruce. Bruce Campbell. Is, yeah, Bruce Campbell. <laughs> Bruce Campbell. <laughs> Bruce Jenner. I think it's Bruce Lee. And then she's like, no, it can't be Bruce Lee. He's dead. He's, he's dead. Yeah. But no. He comes back. He takes the other drinks that you finished. And you're like, hey, man, thank you. Uh, can you ask the waiter? He's like, sure, certainly. No problem. Is that your Bruce Lee impression? <laughs> wow. My God, that was terrible. That wasn't even like trying. And you're convinced it's him. Okay. You're convinced. Now you're like, yo, I got to follow this dude and see what's up. You follow him to his crib. Somehow he lives like oh down God, the down the blood down the beach through the roof he right now. Down the beach, and you see him. Blood pressure is. He goes I'm home. About to die. He takes off his hat, stuff. You're looking through his window. He starts practicing on the dummy. He has <laughs> wooden. He starts practicing wooden dummy. He does long pole. He does everything. Mm -hmm. All his forms. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 mm -hmm. boom. And then he starts practicing little JKD stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, what the fuck, man. He's 80, but he moves incredible. Uh huh. Wow. What do you do? I would know I'm not looking at Bruce Lee because he never learned the wooden dummy and the long pole. How do you and know? And that's all How do you know? I got to say you know? about that. Know? How do you know he hasn't? That's all I got to say about he that. He probably learned it later. He probably learned it later. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> he probably learned it later. Wow. I'll kill you, Jay. <laughs> he could have learned it later. That's all he's got to say about that. All right, Kung Fu Genius fans, I hope you liked that episode. And as always, if you have questions that you want me to answer on a future episode, go ahead and write those in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilled. Alex Richter, always the victor. The, the, is that all fixed behind you? Does that look good in the frame? Is the door closed behind you? Door's closed and... The door's curve. not closed. The door's not closed. Jesus Christ. City Wing Chun uh, ASMR. Ass. I want you to relax and listen to my voice. It's fing hot in this fing Dre jacket. Know, Dre doesn't know how to tie a knot. <laughs> Mikey, Mikey Dean knows how to tie a knot, but Dre doesn't. Okay, you Stop ready? It. Are we recording? Yeah. Don't edit any of that out. <laughs> Andrew. You ready, Dre? Yes, sir. Yes, oh. sir, man. Okay, great, brother. Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, I'm not doing an intro for this. No. So we're done. Oh, here already, yeah. Gonna, we're done.